Very good. Welcome here. Long weekend. My name is Murray, one of the pastors here at Grace Fellowship. Glad that you're here. If you're a guest here, we pray that you'll be able to uh, be encouraged and, and, and find out that uh, what we mean when we say we're just all about Jesus and want to make it all about Him. Thank you, Tim, for getting the, the file enabled for the deaf community to be able to follow along. That's a huge help. Thank you again to Jan for, for sound and all our other volunteers. We just so appreciate that. It just takes a lot of people coming together, doing a lot of little things to uh, enable us to, to be here. Uh, we're in the Gospel of John. That's the study that we're in. We're, we're slowly working our way through this entire Gospel that really uh, looks at the life of Jesus, and we get to really behold Him and see uh, His character. We see His works. We, we see who He is and who He claims to be and why He, he came. And the, the big idea of the Gospel of John really is that we have one great need, and and that need is not to clean ourselves up. That's not the need for a new job, um, not, not the need of a better spouse or uh, a wealthier boyfriend or a prettier girlfriend, but the great need of our life is to really see Jesus as he really is. And so John wrote this gospel so that we could see Jesus, and his prayer is that God might grant us life to believe and then find this absolutely joy-filled eternal life with him forever. So we're excited about this book. It's a great book, and we've reached chapter 8, and it's here we're, we're starting a new mini-series that will be through the entire chapter, chapter 8, called Freedom and Slavery. And today's opening message is going to be Freedom from Condemnation. And I just love reading of the encounters between Jesus and broken people, because it just really gives me hope. And so, uh, the interesting thing too, in chapter 8, we're going to find in this series, there's really two bookends. The, the chapter is going to start with the attempted stoning of a sinner, and it's going to end with the attempted stoning of Jesus. So, here's our scripture, John chapter 8, then the first 11 verses. If you don't have a Bible to follow along with, or if you don't have a, a Bible yet on your uh, app on your phone, there's still a, a Bible or two yet on the table. You can take one of those and, and use it to follow along. If you don't own a Bible, you can't afford a Bible, then please just take one of those Bibles. It's our gift to you. Take it home, and then you can read the whole account of John, who's an eyewitness, close disciple of Jesus, what he writes about his experience with, with Jesus, the Son of Man and the Son of God. So, Scripture will also be on the screen, so John chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. Reading from John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. They went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go. And from now on, sin no more. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you again that you've given us this book, that you're a God who communicates with us so we're not left just to feel around in the darkness, to wonder, make conjectures about who you are and about what's true and what ultimate reality is. But you've spoken and you've given us this word so we can dig back into it, go back over it, examine it, meditate upon it, and behold who you are and the amazing story of what you've done for us in Jesus. So I just pray, Lord, that you would open all our hearts and minds, ready to receive what it is you have for us this morning. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. 
Now, now some of you may note, some of you may just have glanced over it, but if you have in your Bible, beginning at chapter 7, the last verse in chapter 7, verse 53, right through to the end of this section of verse 11 in chapter 8, your Bible may have a little footnote, may have a little asterisk, something to a little insertion, something that's going to indicate to you, and it might say something like, the earliest manuscripts do not include this. It might even say, uh, if they've got a little more bias, they might even say that the the most reliable manuscripts do not include this. It might say, the best manuscripts do not include this, which I think anytime you're going to use most reliable or best, uh, without telling us what the basis of your argument is to determine what's best or most reliable, I think there is some bias there. But we want to let you know that when they're referring to the earliest manuscripts, it's actually referring to two manuscripts. And these two manuscripts were found at the same time in the same place in a small city about 125,000 miles uh, south of of Cairo in Egypt. So these are these two Egyptian papyri. They were found in 1952 in a rubbish heap. And so this section of scripture um, certainly is in the majority of manuscripts, but it's not in the two earliest dated manuscripts, which again, were found together. Um, There's also a number of differences in those two manuscripts from one another, and also a number of differences from those manuscripts, many other, I think there's about 300 differences between that and the majority of manuscripts that there are. In the manuscripts where it is actually included, um, it's not always in this place. It can be sometimes at other places in John. In fact, in some manuscripts, it's actually found in Luke. And so um, because of that, um, people also then look to the early church fathers and see, did they reference it? Many don't reference it at all, but there are a few. There's a couple of early church fathers that do reference this passage, including one from the uh, around 125 AD makes mention of this passage as well. So when it's all said and done, everyone ends up concluding that this is a real event in the life of Jesus. It's something that actually happened. They clearly, and the way it's written, is clearly an eyewitness account for sure, but not all agree that it should be in the scriptures. And so um, I ended up having to study this for a long time, spent about three years of intense study, really looking over uh, different manuscripts and different things, and uh, did this. This was some time ago. And the conclusion that basically I reached at the end of all that time, besides getting a headache, uh, was that it actually does belong. Now, it may not necessarily be at this exact spot, but I can see and understand exactly why scribes would have placed it here if they were uncertain of where it is, because it becomes the perfect illustration of the teaching in chapter 8 that's going to follow. And it just becomes an exact illustration of the points that is going to be brought out later. And I think the fact that uh, for the last 2,000 years, it has been included in the Bible for a reason, as well as some of the early church fathers speak of it. Um, For example, Augustine, he says this about the passage. He stated that some had earlier excluded this passage because they felt it makes Jesus look like he sanctions adultery which I actually don't think it does, but, um, but if, if textual criticism is something that turns your crank, we can talk more about that later. But I just wanted to give that as a little intro just before we consider the incident as well, because you may have that note in your Bible. Um, the other thing as we approach this incident, I think you should find that there should be at least one of the characters that you can relate to. It may actually be uh, the woman who is caught in adultery, and maybe it's just the, you can relate to just the shame, the guilt that she carries. Others of you maybe will relate better to the religious leaders, the Pharisees, who are very quick to judge others, condemning others even sometimes for sins that you might be guilty of yourself, but blind to. And then there's going to be still others who are going to be like me, kind of dysfunctional, and you can kind of move back and forth between the religious and the irreligious, the, the woman and the, and the religious leaders, depending on the day and the way you sin against God. And so um, I definitely get a glimpse in the mirror of myself in all of the characters in here, except for Jesus. He sort of stands alone, unique. And so we have then in uh, the end of chapter 7, It just says, so while the religious leaders basically went to their own homes, right? So we see that. But Jesus, in the meantime, he ends up going to the Mount of Olives. 
We see that in verse 1, because he had no place to lay his head, right? He lived as an exile with eternity in view. Communion with his father was what his great delight was. And, and we see him often just pulling away from the crowds to get focused time in prayer, whether that meant late at night or whether that meant very early in the morning. But he was going to get this focused time of prayer and communion with his Father. It was just necessary for him. And I think if this is a need and pattern in Jesus' life, how much more is it needed in my life? You know, should that be true for all of us? So then we get to verse 2. He says, early in the morning, he, and that's Jesus, came again to the temple all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. And so we're in the outer court of the temple. It served as a venue where many of the scribes would gather the students that they would have uh, around them to teach them, and they would expound the law to them. And so here we have it early in the morning, and so we've got Jesus returning now here to the outer court at this time, and he sits down then to teach the people. Because sitting was the posture of a teacher, a rabbi in that culture, which makes me think that maybe they should bring me a chair up here, and I could at least be seated. Or maybe I should sit there, you guys come all stand down here, and that would be, we'd be a little more biblical that way. Um, but for now, we'll work it this way. I think it'll be okay. But I'm not sure why the early hour. Perhaps, uh, perhaps that early hour, because this is a work day. Um, perhaps it was because maybe if this truly did happen, say, after the Feast of Tabernacles, it would have just now concluded. Remember, he just gave that great invitation, the pouring of the water, that part of the ceremony would have happened. The, the Feast of Tabernacles would have ended. It was one of the pilgrimage feasts where all the people would come to Jerusalem. So then maybe before they left and went back to their homes, uh, Jesus was going to take that one last time, maybe to, to teach. But any way you look at it, we certainly know this that here we have the light of the world dawning early in this day, here in the temple, to all of Jerusalem, and soon to all the world. And so this is something that he begins to do. Also, I'm going to comment just about the word all. You notice that word all in verse 2? It, it talks about, and all the people came to him. Um, sometimes people get confused by the way... Uh, the Bible uses words like all um, because then they can only really see it. They sort of look at it narrowly, interpret it only from sort of this real narrow, dry, literal, uh, absolute sense. But just like most words and, and the way language works and we accommodate ourselves, in most usages, the word all simply means like all manner of, all manner of. And then other times, of course, it's just, it's narrowed by its context. So you're always going to take the context that it is there. Just like if I said, well, all the people took off their coats. You know, it was very, got very warm in here. All the people took off their coats. Well, what if two people didn't even come with coats? Does that make me a liar? No, it's just language. It's just how we talk. It's just the accommodating way that we, we say it, right? So I'm not referring to all the people in Saskatoon or certainly not all the people in the world, right? When I say that, I'm referring to a contextual part, a certain group of people all took off their coats because of the warmth in the room. And so don't get thrown by statements, you know, like all the people came to him and then think, wow, what's wrong with the Bible? No, it's just saying all the people who were there that morning, all those maybe who arrived early, they were gathering to hear what he had to teach. And then now enter stage left, the scribes and the Pharisees, right? And they're about to hinder the learning of the people because they got their own agenda. So verse 3, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? So now, they do address him respectfully as teacher, although um, only the night before, right? And even if it wasn't just the night before, certainly they, they're, when they're talking amongst themselves, they address him as deceiver, one who's got a demon, right? So that's what it is. So I start thinking, here they are, uh, they call him a deceiver, and yet here they come up to him with flattering lips and say, oh, teacher, I wonder who's the deceiver. And so they haul in this woman. She's been caught in the very act of adultery. So they put her right in the midst. She's going to be shamed, humiliated. I don't know if she's just covered with a blanket, her nakedness covered, or what it is. And one thing is we're not sure where the guy is. I don't know about you, but I, the first thing I wondered when I got there, so 
She's caught in the very act. And where's the guy? You know, because according to the Mosaic law, both parties were to be brought to justice. Despite the fact, though, that she was set up here. And she's really just being used as a pawn in their scheme, right, against Jesus. But we also know this woman was not an innocent victim. She's not an innocent victim in all this either. Now, the word translated adultery is a word that refers to any sexual activity outside of a marriage covenant, the kind of marriage covenant as God designed it for. So the Bible teaches us that sex is a way of expressing to someone the absolute, complete, exclusive, and permanent commitment to someone else. And so it was really designed by God to be this glue that would just bind a couple together in this one flesh marriage union. And that's why the reason that the Bible gives for really uh, having uh, sex inside a marriage. And so the Bible says that sex was invented by God then as God's way of saying to someone else, I completely and permanently and exclusively, you know, belong to you. And so that's why it's supposed to be for marriage between a man and a woman, to be the picture of really that oneness, that intimacy that we will have with God because of the gospel. And so that intimacy and oneness never comes apart in, in God's economy apart from total commitment. And you see, that's, that's true of God, right? God just doesn't give his intimacy to you apart from a committed covenant relationship. And so sex doesn't work as it was designed for outside of a relationship of total commitment. Because we could say this, Love is not something you fall into. It's something you commit to. And so adultery then is a grievous sin. In fact, in the Old Covenant, it's one of the, in the top, right? Thou shalt not, Ten Commandments. It's right in there. And it was punishable by death, as the leader said, punishable by death, by stoning. And the accuser would be the first to cast a stone. And then both guilty parties would be justly killed. However, the next verse reveals to us that the religious leaders really weren't concerned that much about justice, but rather the focus for them is trapping Jesus. And it tells us that in verse 6, right? This they said to, to test him, right? To, that they might have some charge to bring against him. So this test is like really to, to trap him. So Jesus bent down. Here's his response and wrote with his finger on the ground. <laughs> See, they're simply using the Bible as a means to their own devious ends, right? Like someone taking their Bible and right, using it to hit their sibling, right? It's just a misuse of God's revelation. But they're referring to old covenant texts um, like Leviticus 20, verse 10, like Deuteronomy 22, um, just basically trying to set Jesus up. Because if he did demand her to be stoned in accordance with the Mosaic law, then they could go to the Roman authorities and basically say what this man has done. And, uh, and this man also, because his, the crowd that followed him, the multitudes that followed him, were I mean, they were made up of, of really harlots, tax collectors, sinners, drunkards, gluttons, all these things. And he was going to pretty much lose face with them as well, because they're coming to him because of his gracious words. And here, if he comes down on the side of the the stoning, yet if Jesus does not uphold the law, on the other hand, he's going to show himself an enemy of Moses and thus an enemy of God. And then how can he be who he said he is? He's not even going to uphold the very law of God. So so basically what this is, they've got him set up. It's a no-win situation for Jesus. Because if he says, okay, let's obey the Old Testament, let's put her to death. Well, then they know the Romans are going to come in, right? And I'm sure they'll quickly, there'll be some quick tattletales right there to uh, make that known. They're going to arrest him, throw him in jail. He'll likely be executed for violating such a Roman law because under Roman law, only they could execute the death penalty. That's why the Jews had to go to Pilate to crucify Jesus. And so if Jesus says, no, I won't put her to death, whether that be because, you know, I just want to just show mercy, just want to show grace. We're not going to apply the law, right? Or maybe it's just because out of fear of the Romans. Well, I can't do that because Roman law says I can't. 
then whatever the reason is, he's going to violate the law of Moses. And so in so doing, according to Deuteronomy 18, he would then be a false prophet. So they think they've got Jesus between a rock and a hard place, right? Now, when you want to trap someone, don't start with Jesus. You know, because Jesus is going to turn the tables here so that these self-righteous Pharisees, they end up as naked as that woman caught in adultery. And he's just going to strip away every single thread of self-righteousness from them, which is a very kind act, by the way, to awaken people to their need. But before Jesus responds, what does he do? They bring this there. He just stoops down, right? And he just starts writing in the dirt. That's what he does. And I think this just becomes a fulfillment of Psalm 38. Psalm 38, read, Those also who seek my life lay snares for me. Those who seek my hurt speak of destruction and plan deception all day long. But I, like a deaf man, do not hear. I'm like a mute who does not open his mouth. Thus, I'm like a man who does not hear and whose mouth is no response. See, they had no idea how low Jesus would stoop in the dust to receive sinners with a just forgiveness. And so in verse 7, back then in John chapter 8, it says, and as they continue to ask him, in other words, they just keep harping at him. They just keep yapping. They're like a group of, of a pack of wolves right at him, right there. They just keep on him. They keep on him. So finally, he, just, he, he stands up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And then once more, he just bent down and wrote on the ground. I just love how Jesus is in total control this whole situation. And when Jesus responded, he did so with such a, a searching of the heart reply. Jesus neither spurned the law. He never excused, made light of the prisoner's guilt. He did not say that the woman had not sinned or that her sin was small. But he reminded her accusers that they were not the ones to bring a charge against her. Unless... So their own hands weren't clean, right? So in the net they spread, right, their own feet were caught. The very law that they appealed to clearly stated in Deuteronomy 17, verses 6 to 7. Who knows? Maybe this is what Jesus was writing with his finger in the dirt. I have no idea. But in verse 6, it says of Deuteronomy 17, it says, On the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses, the one who is to die shall be put to death. A person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. The hand of the witnesses shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hand of all the people. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. And I think maybe Jesus is alluding to that passage in the way he says it, you know, too. So, now, since the scribes and the Pharisees, or at least the witnesses are supposed to be there because they know she was caught in the very act, they would have to be the ones who would dare to be her executioners. So it's just kind of like, I can imagine Jesus just saying this up, and I can just imagine him going, oh, dang it. We forgot about that verse, you know? But though I have no idea what he wrote on the ground, because the Bible doesn't actually tell us, I just am so reminded that when God wrote the law, the way it describes it, he wrote the law with his finger. You know, and, and just that connection, right? And, and since Jesus is the writer of the law, <laughs> you know, the very law they were trying to use to trap him, and now Jesus just confronts them with the law as the author. So verse 9 then in John 8, continues, but when they heard it, so this statement of Jesus, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. So before being shamed publicly then, these religious leaders, they made like ninjas, and they just kind of start disappearing. And 
all their religion, all their rituals, all their feasts, all their sacrifices did not give them a clean conscience. And you notice the oldest left first. Maybe that's because they have a larger portfolio of sins. You know, in your 20s, you think you're smarter than you really are. But in your 50s, you're tempered from all the things you've now learned the hard way. And so, here goes. And the older guys, you know, when he says, you know, let you who is without sin cast that first stone, and those older guys just go, dang it, and they slip away or... Maybe because they're my age, right? They're just too tired. and This whole thing is just getting confusing anyway, so they just slip away. But, but, but all the accusers end up gone. And then here we have just a sinner left alone at the bar with Jesus. And I just picture Jesus coming to her, just knowing his heart. And the Lord, who is called in another passage, the lifter of our heads, and you just know her head is just hung down in shame. And I don't know if he does this or not, but it would certainly fit his character to come and just lift her head, make eye contact. And just to look her in the eye. And then Jesus stood up, it says in verse 10, and said to her, Woman, where are they? Where's all your accusers? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go. From now on, sin no more. And what captivates me about Jesus' response is the order of what he said. He says, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. See, we'd usually reverse those two, right? If you go and sin no more, then I won't condemn you. But Jesus was telling her to change, not in order to be accepted, but to change because he had accepted her. And so we see religion tells you change comes first and then acceptance second. But the gospel just reverses that. It tells us that change comes from acceptance, not for it. See, you see, Jesus knew she'd never have the ability to break free from the idolatry that led her to the adultery until she felt the embrace of a God better than what she had sought in adultery, a love more vast than she could find in any other sinful human. Listen, this is, this is very important. God's acceptance is the power that liberates us from sin, not the reward for having liberated ourselves. So salvation is a gift given to undeserving people like this woman, which then lifts them out of their captivity to sin. That means when, when I talk to a high school girl who's lost her virginity, I don't just tell her about the dangers of STDs or the shamefulness of her act, or, or how she's messing up her future marriage, I also tell her that there's a God who cared about her so much that he left heaven to come after her, took upon himself the shame, the guilt of her sinful actions, so that he could wash her in his blood and make her pure and holy in his sight. Because the only way she'll ever break the stronghold of idolatry that led to those disastrous decisions is by seeing there's a father whose attention is better than what she searched for in a boy. Jesus liberates you from the power of sin, not by holding out a reward in front of you for you liberating yourself, because your captivity to sin is far too great. Jesus liberates you by becoming sin for you and suffering its consequences in your place. See, that's how he breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free.
right? Because there'd be no gospel, there'd be no song to sing if we tried to sing, he cancels, he cancels the guilt of conquered sins. No, first the cancellation, then the conquering. His blood not only releases us from the penalty of our sin, it's that gospel message that releases us from its power. See, the gospel is that Jesus would pay the full penalty for the sexual sin of this woman. In Jesus, we're fully known and fully loved. Would you just gaze for a minute, just in wonder, really, at Jesus' compassion and the grace to us that's pictured in his dealing with this adulterous woman. I mean, how can he do this? I mean, this is unjust, is it not? No, because Jesus is going to satisfy justice. Jesus on the cross, he takes the place of the woman where he is now set in the midst. He is the one who ends up stripped naked. He's the one exposed. And he's the one who takes all the shame and the guilt so that she could become his righteousness. And Jesus didn't say that she didn't deserve to be condemned. God's grace doesn't make light of sin, but you just got to behold the cross to know he doesn't make light of sin, right? Behold the Lamb of God, right? That's the sacrificial Lamb. The Christ has come to silence the law's demand for judgment. It's for this purpose he came, that he might save his people from their sins, right? He himself would be condemned for her. So there is forgiveness and a place in the kingdom for repentant adulterers and adulteresses. That's sweet words. I do not condemn you. Said, acquitted in the high court of heaven said from the only one who has the right to condemn and to judge. You know, we're not free to sin. We're free to go and sin no more, empowered by the superior love of Jesus. You know, when I reflect on this whole episode, I I catch myself just entering into this scene because I recognize I'm a spiritual adulterer. And I, too, have an accuser who's caught me in the very act many times. But the judge of all, the one who's without any sin, who had every right to condemn me, in my guilt, he did not heed my accuser. Instead, he stooped into the dust of the earth, even to the grave, that I would not be condemned. May such grace move us to go and sin no more. Because Jesus is saying, I don't condemn you because I will be condemned for you. And you won't even have a little stone of God's wrath because I'll be crushed under the mountain of all the wrath and justice of God against human sin. You see here in John, it says, right, he says, neither do I condemn you. Or back in Mark 10, it says, the Son of Man will be betrayed, and they will condemn him. And that's the reason why Paul can say in Romans 8.1, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you want to know what a Christian is? This is it. This is it. Every other religion says, either you're not guilty, and thus you're not condemned, or you are guilty, and thus you are condemned. But for a gospel Christian, it's you are guilty and not condemned. You're a sinner and you're utterly accepted. See, man, this woman's day has gone from the worst day of her life to the best day of her life. And it all started with being exposed. Brought to the light all her shame, all her guilt. You know, it's God's mercy to have our sin outed. You ever think, well, how come everybody else gets away with everything and I just do something once and bang, I'm the one who gets caught? Praise God. It is a grace to have your sin outed and exposed. What those religious leaders meant for evil and intended for death, Jesus used for good, resulting in her life. So we see this is not cheap grace, saying you're just accepted and your sin is accepted. 
right? It doesn't matter what you've done, your sin, that that doesn't matter. Well, Jesus, our holy Lord, says, go and sin no more. So we preach grace. We put right in our name, Grace Fellowship, right? And, but some of you hear that, and then you just think you're okay in your sin. But Jesus here, he, he offends both the religious and the irreligious, right? He's an equal opportunity offender. And so both groups called to repentance. Tim Keller, he, he, had this, he tweeted this, uh, this last week, so I thought it was good. I think I put it in your notes. If I didn't put it there... I'll read it here, but he said, religion stresses holiness over grace. Irreligion stresses freedom over holiness. But Christianity is freedom through grace that leads to holiness. I really like that. Well, this adulterous woman, man, she's just, she's, comes in, put in the midst, covered in her, her sin and shame. She's guilty. All right, she can't go back and have a redo. She can't change what she's done. She can't fix it. And Jesus, though, he's going to be treated as an adulterer. He's going to be stripped naked. He's going to bear the guilt and shame, the sin of this woman, accursed on the cross. So this isn't cheap grace. This is not costless grace. This is a grace that cost the Father his Son and cost the Son his life. This is grace achieved at the highest of prices. Jesus was condemned. And that's why he's able to say to the woman, neither do I condemn you. And he was the only sinless one there. He was the only one there who actually had every right to condemn her. But... God. Like it says in John 3, 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And Jesus doesn't say, my grace, that'll free you from the consequences of your sin, right? So you could have this license now to just keep on sinning, keep living in rebellion, and all will be well. No, you can't keep thumbing your nose at the God of the universe. He says, my grace is empowerment to repent of sin and to change by the power of the Holy Spirit who he gifts to us. So there's going to be many times you're going to struggle and you're going to to fail, but, but you'll never, you'll never quit fighting because of this love shown to us in Jesus. So often though, we end up trying to we try to do penance, right? We've got we to gotta try to make it up, right? We try to cover up in our own strength, right? Grab some fig leaves. But Jesus strips us naked. We're just laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. It's so kind of him to show us how desperately, how daily we need Jesus and his grace. And to show us the gracious, loving nature of Jesus, our king, and grace not condemnation is the motivation for righteousness. I don't know if we have any questions. So why do they have to be without sin to throw the first stone? Certainly the, the only ones in the, in the law who could bring that justice to that, one, you had to be the eyewitnesses. So you had to be there. You had to actually have witnessed it. They had to be the first ones to throw it because that would say to verify that they actually witnessed this was that. But I think Jesus is always, because we're always quick to judge others for, I think, the very sins of which we are either guilty of or at least have the potential to be, but for the grace of God. And I think just the reminder of who are we really to judge someone else? Because but for the grace of God, what would I be? I mean, what do I have that I've not received? Every ability I have, the family I was born into, the conscience, the way my conscience functions because of the way I was, I was raised or maybe the, what I was in, all those things, I didn't choose any of that. Is a gift of God. So who I am is... but. By the grace of God, I can't boast. And yet having all the, even the, the opportunities I had and privileges, yet look at the self-centeredness of me. 
Look at my stupid decisions. Look at my sin. Am I going to really cast this stone? I think it was just that, that, that self-reflection, which is why I think from the oldest to youngest, they began to walk out and realize, man, if we're going to really nail the law down hard and let's get every letter of the law down, where am I going to be next? And all of a sudden, he began to, to look, and that just began to expose. I think it was just a term he would use to just, let's expose, let's bring you into the light now. Let's put you in the midst for a moment. And just in their heart and mind's eye, they went, oh boy, unless there's a Savior, unless there's another way than just the law, and I'm going to stand and have to measure up to that, I'm undone. I got no hope. You know, I think, I think there is a reason why the Pharisees keep showing up in all the gospel stories of Jesus. I mean, you've got time and time again, you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? And, and, and they all trot out the Pharisees, come out as the bad guys. And whenever I see them, I tend to think. This is usually my first thought, you know? You guys are such proud-filled morons, right? I'm glad I'm not like you which is such a pharisaical thing to think, right? That thought is pharisaical. Looking at another sinner and thinking, I would never do that, right? I'd never sink that low. See, the Pharisees are here in the Bible to show us ourselves. See, the, the Pharisees are so aware of this woman's guilt and so blind to their own ugliness. And so the love of God for such an unworthy person, they didn't even have a category for that in their minds, much less as a joy in their hearts. So may we hear the voice of Jesus as did this woman. Right? Your accusers aren't here to condemn you, and neither am I. Right? They shamed you, but I'm covering you. They accused you. I'm forgiving you. They humiliated you, but I'm dignifying you. They excluded you, but I'm welcoming you. Jesus is where sinners can live again. What this woman doesn't know is at that moment, right at that moment of that episode and that scene, you know where Jesus is headed? The shadow of the cross is looming in his life, right? At that very moment where he says, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more, right? She doesn't know at that moment he's on his way to the cross to bear her sin for her. Because what she did the night before and any nights before that and anything after that would be washed away by the blood of his cross, because he is going to pay her penalty under the wrath of God. And if Jesus bears our condemnation, then we bear it no more. He who wore a crown of thorns now wears a crown of glory. He who, was, who wore our shame now clothed with majesty. So it's because of the love of Jesus, because of the tremendous grace he's bestowed on us, because there's no more condemnation, all because of him. So let us now, by his spirit who is in us, let's go and sin no more.